All right. Well, good morning, everybody. We are going to talk about um, what's going to happen in the next week or so. I like to do this first. Uh, this reminds you of the kind of things that are going on and that will be important for you to keep up to keep up with everything. Um, we are going to cover chapter 11. I'm going to start chapter 11 today. Chapter 11, in my opinion, for students particularly, has so much going on. I'm trying to get this to work for me. Um, there's so much going on in this chapter. I mean, it's outrageous and I don't want to rush through it. Um, so what's going to happen throughout the end of the semester is we're going to go over chapter 11. Then we're going to skip 12 and go straight to chapter 13 and 14. Um, this week, I will start chapter 11 and we will have, I will make available a quiz, which will be in Brightspace. Brightspace will have the quiz and it'll cover chapters eight and nine. These chapters are relatively straightforward and not too difficult. They will be completely multiple choice and you will get 25 questions. Um, so it's, that's not too bad. I will try to cover, I think, I think what I'm gonna go over in the quiz will be more terms and definitions, not so much computations. These two chapters, I may not really jump into computations. Just wanna get you familiar with the concepts. So chapter eight and nine would be the quiz. You'll have a whole entire week to, um, to get it done. It's only worth 50 points. Um, so I'll just be aware of that. Um, today in standard costs, I remember uh, mentioning to all of you that standard costs is going to be pretty much the final chapter and it really ties together as chapters nine and 10. Chapter nine, we talked about budgets. What is a master budget? What components are a master budget and why it's used? and what its limitations are. And then in chapter um, 10, we talked about how to evaluate an organization's performance using some type of some, you know, computations and some analysis in that, return on investment, et cetera. Today, we're gonna to talk about budgets again, but in light of a different kind of concept. And the reason why I think chapter 11 requires me talking to you for a couple sessions um, is because there's so many different formulas in this chapter and that many students really get overwhelmed by them. So I don't want to rush through the chapter, but I will also want to make certain I talk about it very slowly and carefully. So I'm not going to spend the entire um, hour in this conversation about standard costs. I'm going to just take it piece by piece. And what I hope to do so that you will get the opportunity over the weekend to review this chapter is to talk about what a standard cost is and how variances, variance, um, direct material variances and direct labor variances are used and calculated and what they tell you. Um, computations in this chapter are not hard. It's just so many of them, so many of them. I don't know if you could tell me, I think in your chat box, I was going to send out a little poll, but if, in your chat box, if you can tell me, did you get a chance to look at that chapter? Because maybe you don't know what I mean when I say a lot of computations, a lot of formulas. Did you have did anybody take a look at the chapter 11? I can do a poll, but sometimes a poll takes so long. Let me see if I can create a poll. All right, so let's see if I can get this to work. Launch poll. Here's the poll. Answer in the poll within a few minutes, a few seconds. Uh, let me know if you have reviewed the chapter. And you don't, and I don't, and I'm not talking about reading it. I know you haven't read it, but just to, to look at it, because usually when I'm in school years ago, I would look at the chapter to see what's coming at me, so to speak. All right. Okay. So looking at the chapter, for those of you who looked at the chapter, um, here's the results of that poll. Now, for those of you who looked at the chapter, you'll notice that 
there are so many different formulas that you'll have to know what they mean. I'm going to tell you immediately that these uh, formulas are not hard, but there's so many of them that it might become a little overwhelming. My suggestion is what I have done with my little cheat sheet, and I, and I did this because I want to be able to go over certain things. With my little cheat sheet, I just put up little, a little document like this, really small piece, and just wrote down some of the, the actual formulas and what they're trying to give you. This chapter, you can get through it. It will not be heavily covered on the, um, on the final exam, but I will cover it in the exam, exam number two. So you're gonna you're gonna have to get to know these formulas and what they mean and how to use them only in light of a multiple choice question. I will not overwhelm you with a problem. I just I think this is just too too much, too much for this chapter. So when you decide to go through the chapter and read it, read it very, very slowly and very, very carefully and jot down all the formulas on one sheet of paper and so you can have that sheet of paper with you as you're working through your homework, et cetera. Okay. So let's go right into the lecture for today. What I want you to, what I want to emphasize in this chapter is the point of a budget is to evaluate, to estimate or create some kinds of goals for the organization. The organization wants to know if they're meeting their goals and if they're not meeting their goals, why? And a, and a budget provides you that. With this particular um, chapter, we're going to be talking about standard costs and all these different terms and all of that. Don't be overwhelmed by it. Just understand what we're trying to accomplish. And I think you can navigate through the sea of all of this information that I'm going to prepare for you. I'm going to give you to this week and part of next week. All right. So I'm going to share my screen and just introduce you to chapter 11. All right. Standard costs. Now, what are standard costs and why are they important to an organization? I like to use um, Apple as an example because they are a manufacturer of iPhone and iPads and they want to be able to minimize their costs and they want to be able to make certain that they're using their costs efficiently or whatever cost, variable cost. And you, we all know variable cost is, the, is going to be the driver. It's going to be the driver because that number goes up or down depending on how many units we produce. And our overhead is another cost that we want to monitor and be very careful because we want to make certain that that uh, not only are we not over allocating or under allocating, but we can uh, determine some efficiencies in how we manufacture products. So when the word standard cost or anything that has standard in front of it, I want you to hi highlight in your mind budget. When you talk about standard cost, you want to know what the budget is and what we'll be comparing and contrasting in some cases the difference between budget and actual. And in the, in the previous chapter, we said our budget is X amount of money for our sales and units and all of that. Well, they're changing that term for some reason. I don't know why they do, they're doing this, but standard cost is the budget. It's a budget for a single unit of product. So it's not the actual. So when you're trying to determine whether what your variance is, and you take and you're given actual, well, what are you going to compare it with or what do you want to subtract it from? You want to subtract it from your budget and your budget is your standard cost. So what we want to do is our practical ways of evaluating our budget, considering waste and other types of things. We want to make certain the waste and inefficiencies are considered when we're trying to deal with evaluating our costs. Um, so I would say for Apple, Everything is wonderful, everything is ideal, and all of that kind of thing. But right now, we're dealing with a pandemic, and we're dealing with I just, um, things are not ideal. Things are not perfect. We are dealing with the fact that we can't actually produce, we can't ship our, we can't receive the products that they are, are manufactured in China to the United States. What are we going to do? How are we going to deal with that? What effect does that have on our budget? These are real questions that um, organizations are actually asking right now. You know, particularly Apple, when everybody knows that Apple gets most of their really small parts. I mean, this phone here, for example, this phone here, you know, I have a, um, an Apple phone. And I can tell you, um, nearly 90% of the parts that are used on this iPhone 
um, come from products that come that are from China. And they're going to try to figure out, well, what are we going to do? We can't manufacture products. I know people personally who actually would repair these phones. And the phones come straight from China and they have to repair them. Well, they can't do their jobs now. So organizations are really try are really scrambling and their standard, their standard costs are just going through the roof because they have to do things differently in order to continue to run as a viable entity. So using the ideal standards is no longer appropriate. Using perfection is just absolutely a, a, a joke. We're right now trying to figure out how can we attain it given the circumstances that we're dealing with. So we want to make certain that when you're having standards, you're Let's see, can you see me? Okay, I had a message on my, um, on my computer. When you're trying to develop standards, you gotta make certain that you look at what you've done in the past, just like you and me. If we are going to take this job and this job is in another state, we have to consider a lot of things that we, we normally wouldn't have to consider if we were trying to get a job within our own city or our, with our own state. We gotta consider how much it's gonna cost us, how is it different, is it gonna call, create some issues of uh, me having to move, that sort of thing. Or we're trying to update our, um, do we have the fit sufficient assets to, to do this job, to go to this different area or location? In the case of a, um, an organization, they have to look at what they have used in the past. Apple has to look at what they've used in the past and how they've used it and the number of resources, human resources was necessary to get that. And always look at the past to see how you can, um, guide or gauge the future. Then you have to think, what do you have in place now? What do we have right now? What is available right now? If it's current costs and inputs, how many employees do we have available right now to, to do the job? And then in the future, when it comes to the pandemic, what do you need in the future to keep the business or continuity of business despite acts of violence, acts of, 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 of pandemics, or any type of thing that you can't control on your own, that everybody's dealing with. And then with all of that, how much do you need? Now, that information may not be necessarily um, a difficult quanti a quantify quantity to, um, to calculate, but in light of supply, in the light of demand, in the light of what's going on in the economy, that might be a little bit more complicated. So when we're talking about standard costs, what we have to remember, we're gonna talk about our costs, are our direct materials, our direct labor, and our manufacturing overhead, the variable and the fixed component of our overhead. We talked about this before because in chapter seven and chapter six, we were able to calculate the components of fixed and variable within our manufacturing overhead. And I was using the slope and using regression analysis and all that kind of neat stuff. So we are remembering all that stuff. But now we have to think about how do we calculate our budget costs or our standard costs for direct materials. And that's formula number one. Formula number one. And when you look at your chapter, you're going to see these, uh, I'm going to get my pen here. You're going to see these formulas. And I suggest breaking them down as easy as possible to remember. Standard quantity of, of direct material, you'll see an SQDM. That's going to be your little abbreviation. So if you want your standard quantity of direct materials, you're going to have to multiply it by the standard price. And the standard price is going to be the budgeted price. What is, what is the amount of budgeted sales price for our product? Simple as that. So SQ or SQDM multiplied by SPDM is going to give us our standard cost. Our standard cost in quantity, our standard quantity times our standard price gives us our standard cost per direct materials. And why do we need this information? Let me tell you, when we're trying to calculate how much it's costing us for materials, the per case or the per product cost is going to be quite essential because that's the number is going to be pretty much fixed. And all we need to do is multiply that by the number of units that we're going to be producing to come up with our total cost. So the same is true for direct labor, SQDL, SPDL. What is our standard quantity of direct labor hours times the price or the standard price of our direct labor 
So if we are going to determine how much it costs per case for an individual person who's actually manufacturing or part of the manufacturing process, we need to be able to calculate that. So the calculations are pretty much straightforward. There are just so many of them. I do not suggest anyone uh, memorizing these formulas. I suggest finding a way that's easy for you. And what I did, um, I don't know if you can see this, but let me try to, let's see if you can see it. Oh, it it's too, it's pink, it's hard to see. But what I did so that I can help you is when I see a formula, this is a standard formula. And it's formula number one. I did it like this. I said SQDM multiplied by SPDM is equal to my SCDM. What does that mean? And I'm not saying you should do this, but that's how I think and how I remember things. Um, I abbreviate my calculations. And because there are, I'm going to guess, and you guys can check me on this, but I am certain there are about 12 to 15 formulas in this one chapter yes and that means a number of things when you're dealing with a whole lot of formulas in one chapter your job is to isolate those um formulas and put them in certain categories and know what category to draw from when you're trying to resolve a problem now i'm going to think about this in one way let's see now, if I want to create a calculation for what is my, my standard cost of direct labor, I know all I have to do is multiply my standard quantity in hours by my standard price in hours, labor hours, my price of labor, meaning um, $22 an hour I'm paying on average to my staff who's gonna be creating these products. If I take my standard quantity, that my standard price, I know what my standard cost of direct labor is. And that's going to be important because if I take that number and multiply that my, by the number of units I'm producing, I can tell you this is how much it costs in budget, in budget language, how much it costs in my labor, and then I can calculate my direct materials. This is how much it costs in my direct materials and the two together. And then we work on our manufacturing overhead. Why are we doing this? Because we want to be able to uh, create a budget by which we can compare what our reality is. And our reality is called actual. And the same is true for our manufacturing overhead. Again, we are using manufacturing overhead as an allocation. Remember, we've done allocating costs and using uh, predetermined rates. I hope you remember this. And we're using departmental rates and all of that. In this particular chapter, we're going to be using an allocation base, which should be given to you. Total estimated, and again, this is another formula, total estimated variable overhead divided by the total estimated amount of allocation. Now, again, these are not necessarily difficult uh, formulas. There are just so many of them. So your job will be to understand what this particular formula is going to give you so that when you're looking at a problem and you're asked to calculate the standard cost of direct materials, you'll know exactly which formula to use to make that computation. Do not, rec do not memorize these formulas. Just know what they do and how to use them when a question is given to you. That's the most important thing, what you need, that's all because there are too many of them in this chapter and we're only going through one chapter. Of, this, this was a cost accounting course I would say you need to memorize these um, formulas because cost accounting in this chapter, um, in cost accounting, it covers three specific chapters. So this particular chapter has been split to three different chapters. And in some ways it might be easier if you just take this one big chapter and break it into three. But in this course, it's smushed into one, which is why I'm giving you a lot of headway because I'm telling you, you're doing three times the work in one chapter. Don't be afraid, just realize that if you're struggling, I understand, okay, I understand. Um, my management, uh, my, my, my cost accounting co um, classes, they cover this in three different chapters and they have two chapters that precede it that actually prepares them for these three chapters. And you guys only had, you know, you didn't only have but one real good chapter that actually prepared you for um, budgeting. So you're actually doing a lot of work in a little bit of time. So be patient with yourself. So recommendation number one, create 
a, a cheat sheet of formulas for this and group them into categories. And by doing so, you can utilize your little cheat sheet. Instead of going through your chapter, don't get me wrong, I'm looking at my chapter right now. And I have, I, I have a printed copy of the chapter. And I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, oh my goodness, there are so many different formulas. How are our students gonna remember all of these formulas? Now, if you don't have the kind of time and you're still, you're working, you're one of the few people on this planet that actually can go out and go to work. Because right now I go to work but once every three weeks, just letting you know. There, now, if you look at, um, I think it's on, I don't know if your book has page numbers, but it's really close to the end, very close to the appendix. And I wanna give you this because I want to help you not get overwhelmed, but be more efficient with your time when you're studying. And there are, there's a page called Decision Guidelines. And what this little sheet does, I'm gonna show you, it's, I hope you can see it. Decision Guidelines. This is one I think is kind of important. Why I think it's important? Because it does give you an idea of the kind of question. Suppose you have a question that's being asked of you and you're not quite sure what formula to use. This decision guideline really could help guide you in the right direction. And why do I say this? I say this because this chapter is gonna ask you a lot of different questions and they may seem random, you know, they may not come into a certain category, but if you kind of understand the, the narrative where it's asking you, I'm trying to decide on something, 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 I'm trying to make a decision on something, 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 you can kind of deduce the type of problem is asking you to solve. And I'm trying to make this one chapter, which should be three chapter um, uh, process, a little easy for you to, to understand and to learn. So that's one suggestion, looking at the decision that the, the, the problem is trying to address and maybe helping you guide you as to what formula is appropriate for you to use to solve it or formulas because a lot of them are multiple um, formulas that you'll have to do step by step by step to achieve that one answer. And that's another issue that I'll talk about um, later. The other area that I think um, in your chapter that I think is quite useful, I'm trying to find it because I wanna guide you guys when you're reading this chapter over the weekend, oh my God, how many, how many formulas are we gonna be dealing with? There is a page that gives you the, a summary um, exhibit 11-9 is a very good one. I'm going to put this on the screen so you can take a look at it and you can find it in your electronic textbook right here. If you can see this, let's see. This gives you a summary of the actual formulas. And if you look at it, there are about one, two, three, four, five. There are five different computations that you'll need to make. And it's and then remember also that it's gonna be using abbreviations. Remember before I said um, SQDM multiplied by SPDM is equal to SCDM. Now that might sound a little bit, you know, that's a little over the top, but trust me, in this chapter, you're gonna really find, you may very well find that abbreviation helpful. Okay, um, so in 11 9 exhibit, that's a summary that I think you could also benefit you. And, and those are the basic standard, uh, I would say, standard calculations that you'll be computing. Let me see what other exhibit that I think you should either print out or create a summary that you can use. Uh, let's see, there it is. On the last summary that I think is very important as you're going through this chapter, is called the, the Standard Guidelines for Standard Cost. Let me see if I can find another one. It's gotta be more than this in here. It's gotta be. I just wanna make certain you get through this chapter without losing your head, without actually going nuts. Very, very um, easy to go nuts in this chapter because there's so much going on. So that, I believe, is gonna be very important. Read through the chapter. Now, why do we care about standard costs? Why do we care about standard costs of manufacturing overhead or direct labor or direct materials? Because we wanna be able to have a very, very succinct way to measure accuracy and reliability of what we have done. If we have created 
these products and we have actual costs, we want to be able to measure the, the, um, of, of the prices. Are we paying too much? Are our prices too high? That's one problem that we want to solve. Are we using our labor force efficiency, efficiently, our efficiency variances? We want to be able to use people. We want to be able to make certain that we're not wasting unnecessarily, wasting time, materials, and money. So calculating your standard cost is going to give you a measuring stick, a measuring stick by which a decision can be made. We already know how to compute the variances. The question then becomes is how do we compute what the standard cost is? And how do we can how we can and then our ability to measure that against what actually occurred to determine the true variance, efficiency variance, price variance, cost variance. Those are all going to be um, tools. So in this chapter, um, I am want to make certain that it's clear. Let's go to the next slide here. How to calculate that. Again, creating cheat sheets of these different type of formulas will be extremely helpful to you and most certainly you can use let me remove this um here so you can see the entire screen hold on i'm gonna move this okay hopefully you can now see the whole screen now in this particular example what you're looking at is standard cost calculation is not necessarily comparing it to actual all you're looking at is how the the, the book wants you to see and compute and compute standard cost and when i say standard cost remember i'm talking about budget it's become very important standard cost is the budget okay it is not actual and i and i don't know why they um in chapters eight chapters nine and 10, I don't know why they use the word budget in those two chapters and then all of a sudden they decide to use standard cost or standard. I don't know why, but just so you know and not be afraid that standard cost is the same as budget, okay? So here is the example of that. How do we compute standard cost of one unit? Again, it is gonna be the standard quantity multiplied by the standard price. The budget quantity times the budgeted um, price is going to give us our budgeted cost. If you want to use that as an analogy to help you through the changing of nomenclature in this chapter is absolutely unbelievable. All right, so what we want to do, we want to make certain that, first of all, we want a budget that makes sense. We don't want to just throw numbers up there. We want the numbers to actually be relevant, useful and could be um, and for decision making, okay? We wanna make certain that our products are done in such a way or created and manufactured in such a way that minimizes waste and inefficiency. And if there is some areas of inefficiency, we wanna be able to find it and fix it. And, and this computation does help that. Again, the human element is always um, important to consider. And we're not considering that in these budgets. So budgets have limitations. Um, so using standard costs to develop um, a flexible budget. Now remember back in the chapter, I think chapter, I think it was chapter 10. It may have been chapter nine, but nevertheless, we're talking about these variances. Yes, yeah, chapter, actually chapter 10. We get our standard cost per uh, base. We got our number of base that we actually pay for. This is the actual cost. If you see in column C, here are the actual costs right here. And then here's our standard cost. If we take our flexible budget, which is what we're doing, using standard co costs to create a flexible budget, we're creating a flexible budget. That's what we're doing. We can see now we got a difference here. Our actual cost is 224,000. We actually, and our budget is 232. Do we have a variance? Of course we do. Why is the variance favorable? Because we spent less than our budget. We spent less than our budget. And so, and then it goes straight down the line. And then if you want to notice that when, in some cases, the budget variance, we can net that. What is our overall, let's see, I'm going to calculate it. What is our overall variance? Would it be favorable or unfavorable? Let's find out. If I take um, this, un this favorable variance and subtract the unfavorable variance, looks to me that we have an overall favorable variance of 25. And what did I do to get that? And this is going to be something that's going to be, you know, um, 
you viewed in your chapter. The, what I did was I took these unfavorable variances and I netted them. The unfavorable variances were going to be added together, which is 775 plus a 7700, and I'm going to net it or subtract it from the $8,500 um, direct materials, favorable, um, favorable variance. What this tells you is overall, you have a favorable variance. But most organizations, particularly management accountants, are not necessarily concerned about overall. They want to know detail. They want to know specifics. And they're going to have to answer questions about the specifics. And the specifics in this case is we got our favorable variance of our materials. We are efficiently using our direct materials and our costs are within budget, in fact, below budget. But our labor is a little bit over. And we, need, we may need to consider whether or not the prices that we have, that our standard cost per hour for labor, maybe that number's a little overstated. We may need to rethink it. And again, as budgets are created, mind you, we are always considering what we've done in the past, what was done in the past, and what we're doing right now so that we can formulate estimates for the future. That's essentially what a budget will do. So how do we compute the variances? This is one of the, and I don't want to go too far in this chapter because I really don't, I want to have us work on problems in our next class. That's what we're going to do to finish up chapter 11. I want to go over problems one after the other. So it would be very important and helpful for all of you to read that chapter because I don't want to go through these problems and you're like, I don't know how to do it. I want you to try to, to, to tackle them and do a little bit of, of the work so that when, when you come back on, on Tuesday of next week, and, I'm, and, and that class is going to be all problems. All we're going to be doing the whole hour, maybe hour and a half, depending on how well you guys grasp the material, is working problems. How do we compute a direct material variance? How do we do, you know, all of that. So right now I'm introducing this to you and hopefully that you'll, you know, get some strategies and practice it um, on your own so that when we come back on Tuesday, I can help you through any problems or questions you might have. This is the first one that I think is going to be interesting that you need. We want to calculate the direct material variance, direct labor variance, and the manufacturing overhead variance. And you'll need to know how to calculate all three. So can, can the split um, budget variance for direct materials into two variances? What it is you're trying to com compute is the direct materials variance. What's the difference between on the left-hand side, your actual costs, and on the left, hand, on the right hand side, your flexible budget. And again, your flexible budget is going to be your standard cost for direct materials, your standard cost for direct labor, and your standard cost for manufacturing overhead. And in this case here, that's the computation. What is the direct materials variance and the direct quantity variance, which will give you the overall flexible budget variance. Now we're going to do some problems, but I want to first just let you see. In this chapter, you look at this, the actual cost. Now, again, there are a lot of abbreviations. They're not overwhelming, but they're there and they might be very helpful to you. Remember back in the beginning, I was talking about SQDL times SPDL. Well, in this case, AC, which is our actual cost, multiply by our actual price. Your actual cost, multiply your actual price. You see? And, and using these kind of abbreviations can be very helpful. Um, Again, another, comp another little small computation, AQ times SP, actual quantity times your standard price. And then computing your standard costs allowed, that gives you your SDA, your standard quantity allowed times your standard price. What are these numbers? What do they mean? What you should be thinking about is I'm trying to compute what the variance is in my direct materials. And this only is, a, this particular um, computation is relevant to when your direct materials purchased is equal to the materials that you've used. Very, very important um, qualifier. But as you can see, there are a number of computations here. There are a number of formulas you're gonna have to know. So what is gonna be our direct materials price variance is gonna be the difference between our AQ and AP minus our AQ and SP, which again, if I'm using my cursor here, these two. It's gonna take the multiplication of this number, the multiplication of this number and subtract the difference. 
Now, the book gives you more than one way to do it. I suggest you find the formula that's easy for you to understand and, and apply and use that because your answer will not change. It's, it really is a matter of you, how can you create these um, or compute these numbers and make sense to you and you can do it accurately. That's, that's the most important thing. Then same here, the standard cost quantity allowed, this is gonna give you your quantity variance. This is gonna give you your price variance. What is your difference in price? Are you spending too much money? Are you spending a little money? Are you efficient in the prices that you're, you know, are, are you actually getting a good price for the, the materials that you're purchasing? And it becomes quite important. This is not, this is all really specific detailed kind of information that organizations absolutely have to have because they can't always pass these costs on to consumers. I mean, my goodness, if you think about a price of a, an iPhone, it's $800. If they're not efficiently using their products and materials and maintaining a level of, of cost that's controlled, they get they they would it would most certainly affect their profit margin. They are not in any position, quite frankly, with the economy being as such, to raise the price. Even Apple have to be considerate of consumers. We sometimes you can't pass the prices um, along, which is why it's essential that you have this information because you can't just say, well, it's gonna cost a little bit more to make this product. You're gonna say, well, why does it cost you more money to make this product? What's the variables that make this number go up higher? Is it because of materials? Is it because of the, um, the um, individuals, the labor? Is it because we're passing on too much overhead? What's the reason for these prices being higher? Because it's gonna take us out of our competitive advantage. We've gotta control our costs. And then such, if you wanna control your costs, you gotta know what makes up those costs and why they're deviating from your, your um, what's the variance? The variance is telling you that your, your materials are too expensive then what do we do? Well, we gotta find other vendors that will provide us the same quality materials at a lower cost. Boom, problem solved. So that becomes the issue here. What, what are we gonna do about these variances? Is it causing us to pass the, the cost on to our consumers? And what impact that's gonna have? That's an ethical issue. That's a moral issue. <laughs> you know, Those are issues that you gotta deal with. I, I can't always pass the cost on to my clients. I can't do it. So then what am I going to do? Discontinued product providing that service? You could, but in reality, no, we're not going to discontinue. What we're going to do is cut our costs in some way. We're going to find out why our costs are exceeding or what our budget is and fix that. And that's what these, this report does. That's what these this exercises should be giving organizations, those um, ideas on why our materials are costing so much. It could very well be the amount of economics. It might be the, the economy. The economy could very well be driving it. In which case, you're gonna make, you have to make a decision. Am I going to reduce my profit margin for my products by unit? Or am I gonna pass the, the cost difference on to my consumer? And if you're a price setter, you might very well get away with that. But if you're a price taker, you cannot do that you're gonna to have to find ways to reduce your costs. And that's what all of this um, pretty much helps organizations do. That's why we're doing it. We wanna we want to track our costs. We don't wanna be efficient in, our, in the operations of our organization. And when we have these price and labor variances, how many people do we have on staff? Do we have too many? Are we paying them at a high, uh, an hourly rate that's too high for us? We can't afford it, to be honest. So what do we do? So if we have an, an, um, an um, unfavorable variance in our labor, what do we do? Reduce the number of hours that they work, make them more efficient when they are actually working. Mm -hmm. I mean, we don't have answers to these questions, but these are the questions that are commonly asked when variances are unfavorable, when they're not, we're not doing very well, we're spending too much money and they're not, they're not as efficient with their time. Labor inefficiencies, I think, will be quite standard in this, in this day and age that we're living in. Why? Because there are times when you literally have to shut down operations. You cannot work. And, that, and the costs, those overhead costs that we talked about, they happen no matter what's going on. Whether you're producing or they're not producing, those costs keep going. And it could very well create these um, unfavorable variances that you can't reconcile that you may not necessarily have to, have to be able to um, pass on to your consumer because you're a price taker. You have to deal with, this is the price that people are willing to pay for my product. And I can't deviate from that. So I'm gonna deal with the fact that my, my gross margin is gonna be some significantly reduced. So direct materials on variances, again, 
computation is very similar. The only difference is we're talking about, we're, we're trying to deal with um, how do we compute all of this and what it does, what does it give us? So labor variances is the same type of thing. Actual hours times the difference between, I wanna get to this one, see if I can find it. Trying to find the little summary, there it is. This is important. This particular summary is located on page, um, very, very important. And I think you really need to make certain that you understand this particular computation because you're gonna see it a lot. And I think, yes, it is going to be demonstrated on page 665, I believe. Yes, I'm out, I am right, 664 and 665 of your text. This is a very, just like a direct material variance, this one's another one that I think you're gonna really need to know. And I would suggest highly that for each one of these, and I'm pointing it to this one here, but this particular um, formula, make certain that you write it down because it helps you with calculating your direct labor variance. Your direct hours, again, actual cost is gonna be our actual hours times our actual rate. That number is gonna be subtracted from our actual hours times our budgeted or standard rate. And again, knowing the relationships among these different types of calculations are gonna be quite important. But I think more than that is knowing how and when to use this calculation when computing costs. What are you trying to compute and, why, and what information you need as your bottom line? You wanna know your total direct labor variance or do you wanna know your price rate variance or you wanna know your efficiency variance? Because the questions could ask you one of those three questions. Could ask you, oh, what's the direct labor rate that varies? Then you'll need to have this information here and here. Or it might ask you, what is your efficiency variance? Then you'll need to have this, these two information pieces of information. Or it may ask you overall, what is your direct labor variance period? And again, knowing what you need and what formula provides you the answer to that question will be quite important. Not the memorization of the formula, but which formula is relevant and how to use it is more important. So write these formulas down. That's my suggestion, writing them down. All right, next here is the summary. Now again, I don't like the summary. I like the detail, especially as you're learning, but is this exhibit is a very important one once you have practiced what you're doing and all in essence you're doing in this case is you're trying to compute your labor variances whether you're being efficient or where your, your price is too high or the net of the two and that's what you're trying to do and why because if you're overspending in your labor maybe the rate's too high maybe they're not working they're working hours but they're not creating the product fast enough inefficient basically time is being wasted and you're still paying these people their salaries or their hourly rate. You get what I'm saying? So those are the kind of things you got to think about and you're never going to know. So here's the summary that I told you that might be important. Um, and again, the inquiry, again, I would suggest the summary that provides you the why of it. And I think it's in, your, in the back of your book. What kind of information, what kind of decision is necessary and then the, pro the type of question or the type of formula that you need to answer that question. For example, if it asks you a question is how is the variable over rate variance computed? How, and they ask you how to compute it. You need to know right on the dime exactly how to compute that and the formula that you need. So this decision guidelines and standard costs and variances, it becomes quite important to have this particular cheat sheet available. Very, very informational um, and very, very critical when you're trying to calculate something, one page, get your answer and make the computation. And again, multiplying one number to, to another number is not the problem. The problem is which numbers you're multiplying together and which numbers you're subtracting. And then using that information to compute a variance, whether it be direct materials variance, direct labor variance, or manufacturing overhead variance that you're calculating. So now, as we talked about before, we're doing all of this work for a reason. We want to know why. What can uh, the direct cost uh, and variance analysis help you? It, it provides you a benchmark. A benchmark is, okay, what is a benchmark? 
if I'm trying to compute how much water I ingest in a day, the standard is um, eight, eight ounces, which is about two liters or half a gallon of water every day. That's gonna be my benchmark. I want to ingest in cold, hard water, no coffee, no tea, no soda, but I wanna ingest one half gallon of water every single day. My benchmark is a half a gallon of water. Then I compare the actual, in this case, um, I only, not, this is not true, I'm just using an example, I only ingested 16.9. So 64 ounces, which is a half a gallon, give or take, and I subtract the 16 ounces that I actually drink, I think I got a variance, an unfavorable variance of 32 ounces. You get what I'm trying to say here? Um, that means that I did not drink enough water in a day. I am under. Now, it's using the same kind of silly analysis, benchmark, your, your, um, your uh, goal, your standard cost is 64 ounces of water. And you drank 75. So you have a variance, a favorable variance of nine or eight or whatever that difference is. That's basically what a standard cost of invariances do. It gives you really a measuring stick. It allows you to make sure that your, your budget makes sense, that it motivates you. I am motivated because now I got a benchmark of a half a gallon of water to drink every single day. I'm motivated because I feel good. I'm, I'm drinking enough water. I, I actually know what I, you know, I have something in my mind I can do. I have a measure. Is that don't drink, don't just give you a say, well, I want you to drink more water, drink more water, drink more water. Be more specific. Cost benchmarks, budgeting gives you specifics. I want to drink more water, but how much? 64 ounces. So simplified bookkeeping, that's all relative. But the main thing is what it can't do, what a budget can't do. A budget is not useful if the information is outdated. That's why we're looking at the past looking at what we're doing now to guide what we do in the future. All three together helps us avoid having outdated and inaccurate standards. Uh, number two, if it's not timely, it makes no sense for you to look at a variance report that's six months in the past. It, it, it's, it's all gone. It's not relevant anymore. That means you're going to have to have these reports done accurately, have to be with the relevant information, but my goodness, it's got to be timely. Um, because it's absolutely wasteful and a waste of time and it absolutely makes no sense because today we're dealing with a pandemic. Last week we were dealing with something else. So if you're going to be dealing with issues that last month where the pandemic was not causing that businesses to be uh, shut down by state government, you would be using numbers that really are not right. <laughs> it, they're not right. Nobody's working right now. Limited business are out there right now. So the information is not going to be useful. So that being said, make sure your performance measures are also important. Um, working with individuals, thinking about how we can cut costs without having to cut jobs, lean thinking, using what you need and no more, <laughs> keeping your costs under control, and also using automation as necessary, not just for the automation purposes. When you can have a person do the work more efficiently and more accurately and, and be able to check things better, use people to do that. So um, variable and overhead variances. This is where I'm gonna stop. I want you guys, and this is where I'm gonna stop in the presentation and I'll take up this in terms of computations and examples. What I want you to get out of this chapter, what time are we at right now? Okay, 10 minutes before um, nine. What I would like to see from all of you in this chapter so far this weekend, today is Thursday. Yes, if you can do me a favor, ladies and gentlemen, because I'm gonna not test you, but I'm gonna be doing computations. If you could go through this chapter and read pages, the first page all the way through till we get to the direct labor variances, which is, I believe, page 670. We don't want to work on the variable overhead um, variances just yet. I'm going to do some problems to help you with that. What I want you to do first is to read the first 10 pages, which is from 654 of your text to 668, I believe. Yes, 668. If you could read those chapters and be prepared 
on Tuesday for me to be um to be the whole session. All I'm going to be doing is going over very specific problems relating to the, these pages that you've read. That's it. No lecture, just going over problems. And then in that course, that class also, I'm going to go over the variable overhead variances, and I'm going to go over them in terms of a problem. And we're going to work all problems in that classroom. So be prepared for that because it would be very helpful to you if you understand what I'm talking about, number two, and that you can work with me as we're going over problems and in terms of uh, uh, classwork, activities, um, engaging, and, 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 and asking questions. So that's going to be your homework for this weekend. If you could do that for me, I'll be very, very happy. And it would be very um, helpful for you on Tuesday of next week. Now, let's talk about the chapter or the quiz. And I'm going to stop my share here. And I'm going to share with you chapter nine, well, not chapter eight. Let me see if I can get this to work. Hopefully you can see this. In chapters um, eight, which is, which is like two weeks ago, I want to go over this because I want you guys to be prepared. What you should expect to see in your quiz is questions on concepts. I am going to be talking about concepts. And the concepts are going to be most certainly how to describe or identify relevant business, information for business decisions. That's what I'm going to talk about. Um, and let's look at this here. I'm gonna ask for different approaches to pricing. And then decisions that are necessary to discontinue a product or to accept a special order. Hold on just a second. <coughs> so you're not gonna get, you're not gonna get computations in this quiz. I might throw an extra credit in there, but you're not gonna get computations. I want to see and to go over the concepts. That's all I'm looking for in chapter eight. Now, let me take a look at see if I can find chapter nine and go over that. Here it is. Hopefully you can see this. Okay, if you can see this, if you can't, just bear with me. Chapter eight, we're gonna talk about concepts and I gave you the two um, uh, learning objectives that I'm gonna be drawing my questions from, number one. Number two, in chapter nine, I don't want you to be, um, to prepare a, a operating budget or financial budget, what I want you to do is describe how and why managers use budgets. I'm gonna talk about concepts. There should not be any um, formula-driven questions in the quiz. It's all about concepts. And the reason for this is because if you've got the concepts down, chapter 11 would be much, much easier to, to, to understand and learn. So I'm gonna be talking about the learning objective number one for chapter nine and learning objective number one for chapter eight. If you can get those two um, and go review those two learning objectives, how and why managers use budgets. That's all I'm asking. It might be two false questions. It might be multiple choice questions, no computations. Then, um, let me go back to the other screen, Let's see. And then chapter eight, I want you to describe the information you need for relevant decision making and what to do or what type of decisions that you need to make. What are the criteria by which you would use to determine if you would accept a special order or you would dis discontinue a product? No computations whatsoever. Just go through the learning objectives one, two, and three, and four in chapter eight, and um, learning objective one in chapter nine. Not too much no computations. If you see a computation in the quiz, remember it is designed as bonus, okay? If there's a computation in there, if I throw it in there, it's not to trick you, it's just to give you extra points, okay? And if you see a computation, it's more likely will be in chapter nine, will be the master budget, that type of thing. But I'm still not sure if I'm going to add that. But if I did, it's a bonus question, and I'm not certain if Brightspace will tell you it's a bonus question. I, I hope it does, but if it doesn't, just note, you see a computation, it's bonus, and it's optional, and you, do, you don't have to answer the question if you don't want to. And I think I'm going to add an extra 10 points to that particular bonus question, if I add it, okay? If I add it. All right, um, we are just about at 9 o'clock. Um, I'm going to stop right here and ask any of you if you have any questions about 
um, chapter 11. Just read the first few chapter, first few pages of chapter 11, okay? Don't read the whole thing. And then be prepared to review on Tuesday the, um, the, the different computations that we're going to be going through. How to compute the variances, how to compute the standard costs for direct materials, et cetera. We're going to be doing problems, problems, problems on Tuesday. Any questions so far? Okay. I should have the, the quiz uploaded to Brightspace by the end of today. You have until um, today is the, good Lord, look at this. Today is the 16th. So you'll have exactly one week to have it done. I will also have loaded, um, look at my calendars, give me a second. I will also have loaded today the classwork activity. Um, and the classwork activity, I'm gonna give you until the 25th of April to do. The quiz, I'll give you till the 23rd. And remember, when you're doing the classwork activity, you'll get a grade, okay? You get 100 out of, you know, 100 points or whatever it is. I'm going to always up the grades for classwork for, to 100%. So if you don't get 100% of your classwork, don't worry about it. Just trust me when I say I'm going to go back and update the grade to give you full credit because we don't grade our classwork based on, um, on actual or on, um, on accuracy. I want participation. That's what I'm looking for. So I will definitely make certain that you get full credit. Also, I have also tried to make certain on these quizzes or these classwork activities that I give you a reason. If you've got something wrong, that I gave you a sufficient explanation as to why it is wrong. So that's gonna be something else. So you'll see both your quiz and your classwork activity uploaded for chapter 11 and your quiz, for the, your four, qu quiz number four. Um, you'll see that as well. You'll have until the 23rd for your quiz, and you'll have until the 25th for your classwork activity. Yes. Okay. Any questions so far? Thank you very much for coming out, guys. I really appreciate your time, and I'm hopeful that this um, lecture gave you enough information to get you through for one half of that chapter. Okay. And I'm going to also, as always, make this available to all of you. I'm going to stop the recording now.